you are watching the first Indo-Africa virtual summit uh, hosted by RCA at uh, CNBC Africa. I think we've had some very good insights in terms of uh, the thinking that ought to go into how we can make sure that we are able to accelerate and uh, boost uh, the trade between Africa and India and in particular the collaboration that's required, the structures from a continental perspective as well as bilateral perspective. Let's move on now and talk about the practicalities of increasing trade between the Indian subcontinent and Africa. But first, let's listen to this little sinsetta. The markets of India and Africa encompass 2.5 billion people and GDP of 5.5 trillion US dollars. Since 2001, there has been significant expansion of trade. The volume of trade between India and African countries grew from 5.3 billion US dollars in 2001 to 70 billion US dollars in 2013. At the World Economic Forum in Delhi in 2014, the two sides reaffirmed their intention to reach a trade volume of 500 billion US dollars by 2020. As well as expanding trade, the Indian government supports private investors and aims to diversify trade. With that and the well-established historic strategic partnership and cultural ties between India and African countries, there is great untapped potential for trade and investment. This panel will evaluate opportunities for mutual interdependence. And our discussions for this segment of the session are coming up. Amitabh Kant, CEO, Niti Ayog. Busi Mabuza, Chairperson, Industrial Development Corporation of South Africa and Chairperson of the BRICS Business Council, South Africa. Swithin Munyantwali, Vice Chairman and CEO, ILI, South Africa Center for Excellence. And as you can see, we are very gender sensitive throughout the program from when we started, when we had the ministers, we had the business people, we've had ambassadors, we've had our politicians as well. We now move on to talk about the business of creating business. This session is going to examine the expansion of trade uh, between India and Africa. Let me start with you, Busi, because you occupy an important chair as chairperson of the BRICS Business Council for South Africa. From your perspective, have we neglected India in terms of uh, pursuing opportunities or we have done what we can within the strictures that we currently operate from? Good free, Mr. Moderator. Thank you so much for this opportunity and congratulations to the organizing team for this fantastic, fantastic um, Indo-Africa summit that we're holding at the moment. We can ill afford to ignore India. India has shown a tremendous GDP growth over the last few years. It's a, a, an engine for global economic growth. It has a number of demographic factors in its favor. And you just need to go to any city in India, Godfrey, to see the entrepreneurial energy that is uh, manifesting in those cities. To know that Africa cannot afford to ignore the um, to ignore India as an important partner for our economic growth. I believe that um, a lot of focus has been paid to. Um, the opportunities that present themselves. However, we haven't reached the targets that were set in 2014. The opportunity, therefore, as Africa tries to rebuild its infrastructure, take advantage of the devastation that the COVID pandemic has, um, has put on our economies, as we try to take advantage of the continental free trade area, I believe that the opportunity is for us now to rally together and uh, take advantage of the opportunity. And if I may, 
just um, pause by not quoting, but borrowing from a saying that is attributed to John F. Kennedy. Um, and I will make it apply to the two nations by saying geography has not stopped us from being friends. History has made us family. Economics has made us partners. And necessity must make us allies. Thank you, Godfrey. Thank you, Busi. So as you say, we are extremely short of the targets that were set in 2014. As our sin setter alluded to, we wanted $500 billion, and we are nowhere near there. I think if I remember the figure that I had from the India side is I think we are sitting at around a $67 billion. So, Busi, without, you know, trying to say uh, you are at fault, etc., etc., I'm still going to ask the question, who is to blame? Is it the politicians who have failed to put in place the kind of policies as well as environments that enable the attraction of Indian capital onto the African continent? Or is it because business has been seeing other opportunities elsewhere and hasn't really seen the big opportunity either sitting in India or sitting in Africa? We've seen the policy environment change incrementally. What's important is that business must keep feeding back to our respective governance, governments yeah. on what else needs to be done to relax that policy environment. So I think formations such as the BRICS Business Council are very important platforms for us to give feedback and direction to the government on the policy environment. Um, I don't know if a wholesale change could have been feasible, especially if one looks at specifically that the South Africa-India relations were restored only in the 1990s as we were approaching our democratic dispensation. It's taken a long runway for the businesses to also put hands together. But Godfrey, I think we must acknowledge the gains that have been made to date and look at the opportunity that is ahead of us. So I wouldn't want to be attributing blame at this point in time, but I'd be wanting to call on especially the young entrepreneurs and saying to them, goodness, the opportunity is there. India is growing in multifolds mm -hmm. and the continent is open for business. Please, let's find those opportunities and let's hold hands as we move forward. Let's move forward. Let's invite into the discussion Sweden Munyantwali. He is Vice Chairman and CEO of ILI, South Africa Centre for Excellence. ILI is an international organization uh, for, is it lawyers, uh, if I, am I correct, uh, Sweden? We train a, an offer of, of uh, technical assistance to a cross-section of um, professionals. And, you know, we've been in business uh, since the mid-50s, established here in South Africa recently. Sure. But uh, let, me, let me just thank you, Godfrey, for inviting me to participate in this very important discussion and for all your colleagues at uh, CNBC for putting this together. So from your perspective, I want to ask what you have seen in terms of uh, perhaps impediments to what we're trying to achieve here, as we noted right at the beginning. The numbers are certainly not where the uh, politicians want them to be. Whose fault is it? Let me start off by saying this, uh, Godfrey. Um, if, if Africa were a country, it would be the world's seventh largest economy. There is vast arable land and widespread natural resources, and a region really that is mostly unspoiled uh, from the devastating environmental impact of man, even though we're beginning to see um, some of that changing. Um, despite this, we see two diverging trends. On the one hand, we see many Africans migrating to Europe and faraway lands due to many problems on the continent, while on the other hand, there's a growing number of individuals from China, the United States, Europe, India, and the Middle East flocking to Africa in search of its precious opportunities. This gold rush 
by entrepreneurs and investors looking to turn Africa's unique problems into substantial opportunities. Africa is a market that rewards problem solvers, and you'll see many companies, some South African, that have benefited substantially from doing business in Africa. But I, I see three elements for a successful partnership, and in there lie some of the problems. One, there needs to be purposeful coordination between Indian and African governments to support success. Um, a well-coordinated India-Africa forum, and as articulated by President Ramaphosa at the South African Business Forum last year, and towards reaching the goals set out in Africa's social economic blueprint agenda. Oh, we exploit have... trade with India. And I think we've heard a number of comments about this. It must be successful at its own intra-Africa trade. So we need to study the lessons from the current inter-regional trade arrangements, um, the COMESA and, uh, and others, ECOWAS. Um, have we been competitive in trading with each other? How do we overcome bottlenecks that have frustrated effective intra-regional trade? These lessons will also be useful in the current engagement but also in informing our approach to the African continental free trade area. Finally, Daniel, success in trade requires a working ecosystem. It does not take place in a vacuum. However well-intentioned, if we don't have strong infrastructure, such as accessible electricity, water, road, measured regulation, a capable and well-trained labor force, and a strong rule of law framework, to mention but a few, we will not have the conditions necessary for meaningful trade. I'm going to uh, come back and ask you the answers to all those questions that you posed, in particular, the one around the preparedness of Africa to trade with India and also the preparedness of Africa to trade within itself. Let's park it for now. Let's get in our third participant in the discussion, and that's Amitabh Kant. He is CEO of uh, NITI Ayog. This is a, in, an Indian government uh, think tank. Um, Mr. Kant, from your perspective, when you look at the India-Africa relationship, what are the broad aims from the Indian government's perspective? So India and Africa are two of the youngest regions in the world. While the median age of an African is 20, the median age of an Indian is 26. This is well below the global average. This large pool of young population of 2.5 billion people will drive global consumption in the next few decades. The combined GDP of India and Africa stands at US dollar 5.5 trillion. More importantly, India and Africa are two of the fastest growing economic regions in the world. Even conservative estimates predict that our combined GDP will quadruple within the next two decades. Currently, India is the third largest export destination of Africa. And in the coming decades, bilateral trade relations are expected to strengthen. The latest trade figures indicate a bilateral trade of nearly 70 billion US dollars. With such numbers, I expect all the traditional sectors like pharma, automobiles, minerals, food processing, textiles, all to do well. However, I would place my bet on the services sector to emerge as a critical enabler of growth between India and Africa. The most interesting part about India and Africa is the high level of internet penetration and the fast pace of technology adoption. Concepts like e-money and internet banking have become the norm and digitization has become the buzzword in both these reasons. We are driving digitization in a very big way and I would say that the next wave of tech companies and internet giants will emerge from these regions of the world. Uh, our view is that 
uh, our Prime Minister, Mr. Modi, has int intensified our political and trading engagement with Africa. In the last five years, our long-standing ties with Africa have acquired vibrancy and dynamism. And we've declared Africa as a top priority in our foreign and economic policy. And our belief is that Africa has emerged as an important trade and investment partner for India. Um, I've got a difficult question to ask you. Why has India, with no obvious political differences between it and the major African countries, been overtaken by China in increasing, I'm going to call it bilateral trade, even though Africa is not a country? So, uh, you know, our view is that uh, irrespective of China, uh, India is currently the fifth largest investor in Africa with cumulative investments of over 54 billion. And we have seen a plethora of sectors, including telecommunication, hydrocarbon, exploration, agriculture, education, petroleum, refining, IT services, chemicals, drugs, pharmaceuticals, all have received the bulk of investments in Africa. In the short term, heightened activity is expected to happen in the fields of mineral and mining, chemicals and pharmaceuticals. However, in the long term, I see a lot of interest building up in the field of technology product manufacturing. Africa being the supplier of many critical raw materials for the high-tech industry could very well transform into a manufacturer of low and intermediate goods for technology yeah. products. Yeah. India is also at a stage of industrialization where it is moving rapidly up the manufacturing value chain. Both global geopolitical environments and domestic factors are in favor of industrialization of India and Africa. Yeah. The new age manufacturing through global value chain will help both these regions establish integrated supply chains for technology product manufacturing in the medium to long term period. Our view is that even prior to the COVID, you had American companies relocating and looking at alternative uh, destinations for investment, yeah. and the global supply chains from China will get disrupted, and hugely disrupted. And therefore, companies from America and Europe will all look for alternative destinations, and both India and Africa have a unique opportunity. Yeah. So I hear you saying that uh, the growth of trade between Africa and uh, the stronger growth aspect of it is in the future. And I applaud that. And I wanted to remind you as well, the biggest source for all those batteries that are going to be required for the electric vehicles, of course, resides here on the African continent. Um, I, wanted to pick up, I wanted to pick up on a point uh, that uh, uh, Mr. Mutrawali uh, made at the beginning when he gave us his address. He spoke about the preparedness of Africa to trade with India, and I guess you can also say vice versa. And I think it speaks into the issue we have just read here uh, with, uh, uh, we, we, with Mr. Mr. Kant. So, Busi, I want to come to you and say, from an African perspective, how prepared have we been in terms of fostering business connections to the Indian subcontinent? Have we been late on that front? Godfrey, we're not late, but if there's anything that I'll change, it is that our export, our collective ex export basket from the continent to, the, to India, it largely comprises raw commodities, non-value-added commodities. I think we lose an opportunity in that, and I think we need to run it together as uh, the African continent to start creating value chains where we start beneficiating these raw commodities so that by the time they leave our borders, some value has been added into those. The, if, if one looks at the import mass from the Indian continent, as Mr. Kant has already indicated, that's where you find petroleum products, you find motor vehicles, high value added um, import mass. I think we we need our Indian colleagues and companies to also see this as an opportunity to 
prominent in the continent and start benefiting some of these materials here so that by the time they leave our borders, some value is left in this country. The time is now for us to take advantage of that. So I'm not worried about us missing the opportunity. I think the growth trajectory of the Indian economy is going to continue as strongly as we've seen it uh, continuing. And we just need to get back on that as best as we can. Industrial Development Corporation is involved in building capacity for uh, the manufacturing sectors within here in South Africa as well as uh, uh, the African continent. But let's go to uh, Sweden. Sweden, you asked two questions that I said I wanted answers to. I want those answers now. From your perspective, how prepared has been the continent? And of course, we are 54 territories, but we endeavor to become one. Secondly, how prepared do you think India on its own has also been uh, ready to do business with the African continent? Uh, thank you, Godfrey. Um, in, respect, in respect to your last question, um, I, I would say I would be worried about India. Um, if you look at the legal process outsourcing or out outsourcing in general, business process outsourcing, yeah. Um, the business that India has been doing with the United States, for example, Wipro and um, Microsoft, with basically Wipro of India, essentially handling all the intellectual property um, business out of India, uh, many billions worth. This began back in uh, 2010. Um, and you look at uh, companies like Bharti Airtel and the muscle um in providing telecommunication services within the african region and then even the cherry on top of that is the revenues earned from mobile money where a lot of the unbanked uh, have now been financially included so i would say that india is prepared the question is whether we are prepared and yeah. you see a lot of goodwill a lot of goodwill within the african continent and certainly the African Continental Free Trade Agreement would not have happened um, but for the um, will of leaders within this continent. So there is a, a, a growing political will, but I think we need to do more. And we don't need to look further than the current uh, trade agreements. So yeah. How long is it taking a truck to go from uh, Congo to neighboring countries and what are the barriers to entry yeah. uh, both tariff tariff and non-tariff um, so i think we need to learn from our performance to prepare for india because yeah. india is, is is very prepared yeah um i think uh, what we need to do is we look we need to look at an ecosystem that uh, godfrey how do we educate our young labor force it's clear that our young labor force is uneducated mm. um how do we enhance our infrastructure look at our road networks, mm. transport networks look at the availability of power um look at our rule of law systems there's a close correlation between rule of law and the ability to do business so all of these things uh, godfrey are critical uh, um, in, uh, in us being able to do business. I would close by saying, Godfrey, that what we really need to do is, in this context of India-Africa, to really have joint working groups to address these issues. Yeah. yeah, because I am sitting and I'm thinking, take the case, for instance, of an Indian business person sitting in Mumbai, looking at uh, coming into Gabon, or perhaps considering uh, it could be Egypt or Algeria or indeed uh, uh, Somalia. And when they look at the laws and they look at the standards that are required for them to enter those markets, they are dealing with 54 different uh, regulatory environments that they have to consider before they are able to come in. Have we been able to solve this through the Africa continental free trade area, Sweden? Well, as you know, Godfrey, the um, Africa continental free trade uh, uh, area is really just taking off. Obviously, COVID has had its impact, and uh, the Secretary General 
has just gotten empaneled recently in uh, in Ghana. Um, so I, I would say, like uh, somebody said in the previous panel, um, we are only as good as the solutions we come up with internally. Yeah. Uh, before we can come up with common solutions together. Yeah. So are we able to resolve these problems internally? And then do we have the wherewithal to address these issues together? Yeah. And um, the, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement is an incredible opportunity for all of us. Yes. Um, but if we don't learn the lessons from the current uh, regional groupings, as it were, we will not seize the opportunities of the African continental free trade uh, area. It's not a silver bullet just to have an agreement. Yeah. I want Mr. Kant's view on that one because I want to understand whether from an Indian perspective, the AFC FTA is a solution in terms of making it easier for Indian capital to flow into Africa or if it, it, it complicates issues. Because in the previous uh, session that we had, uh, one of the suggestions made was that what was required is an EPA, an Economic Partnership Agreement between India and Africa. And we know how complicated and difficult that is. So, Mr. Khan, from your perspective, do you view the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement as a solution or do you see it as a complicating factor? Well, let me say that the signing of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement uh, the largest ever free trade agreement after the establishment of the WTO yeah. provides a great opportunity to boost trade and economic ties between India and Africa. But African countries need to become extremely easy and simple. It's still very complex. It's very, still very complicated. What is complicated? What is complicated, huh? Mr. Kant? All geographical boundaries. Uh, too much of paperwork and too much of procedures and uh, all this. And therefore, uh, there is a need for simplicity, doing away with complexity and making things uh, become easier and simple, both in Africa and in India, for the trade to grow. Both sides need to uh, benefit each other. Yeah. The duty-free tariff preference scheme announced by India has benefited African nations and contributed towards a steady increase in our trade figures by extending duty-free access to 98.2% of India's total tariff lines. 38 African countries now enjoy the benefit of our uh, duty-free uh, tariff preference scheme, and this is enormous. Hmm. Apart from business transactions, India-Africa relations also extend into the area of development and capacity building. India's favorable lines of credit have become popular and currently expanded our development partnership with Africa. Currently, 189 projects in 42 African countries for nearly about close to 12 billion are being implemented under India's LOCs. These projects have had a positive impact in many African countries and are changing the lives of its people yeah. by covering a wide range of sectors. But I think the lesson for both of us is that there's a massive, massive opportunity. And massive opportunity because of uh, democratic dividend, uh, both being the fastest growing regions, yeah. and because uh, this is an opportunity which we should not lose and both of us should make ourselves extremely easy and simple. Yeah. The uh, formula has to be easiness and simplicity for each other's sake. And both will benefit out of this and both will grow and expand. Yeah, I know you have spoken about the need for simplicity, but I wanted to go a little further and dig and ask, in what areas do you want this simplicity? Uh, because... You know, we are broadcasting to the African continent, to different, uh, you know, geographical areas, of course. Unfortunately, unlike, unlike India, we were not able to remain as a single whole after colonization. You guys stayed and were st maintained uh, a, a single country status, which makes it easier. But if you were to give some free advice, number one, to the uh, African Union, number two, to the different uh, individual governments, what would you say in terms of that simplicity that you're asking for? Where does it begin? So firstly, let me say that uh, all countries of Africa must digitize themselves fully. That's the future. There should be no paperwork. 
There should be no geographical boundaries. And secondly, uh, we should have a ranking amongst all African countries on ease of doing business, only for African countries. This should be all outcome based. And therefore, every African country must compete with each other. We are making our states compete with each other. One year, Gujarat came first. Next year, Andhra came first. And third year, Telangana came first. They were all competing. And therefore, they were scrapping rules, regulations, procedures, which have come in over the years. And therefore, you need to scrap rules. You need to scrap laws. You need to scrap paperwork. You need to scrap procedures. Make Africa the easiest place in the world and you'll boom. And you'll boom with growth and you'll boom with jobs. And that is what needs to be done. Sure. And unfortunately, his picture is frozen, but absolutely making uh, great points there. I remember when we speak about this uh, competitiveness, yes, we know, uh, you know in the World Economic Forum uh, ratings, uh, Mauritius is the easiest place to do business on the African continent. I think, if I remember correctly, uh, the second in Rwanda, and then you've got all the other countries coming in. But certainly, as he says, uh, there is work to be done uh, on that front. But this digitization thing is interesting, but we'll come back to it. Busi, I wanted to know if you want to respond to that is that something that you agree with that perhaps it's not as easy as it ought to be for us to even to invest on our own on the African continent before we even start saying can we get more Indian capital or Chinese capital or indeed Russian capital when we consider the uh, BRICS uh, 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 grouping well of course we want the Indian capital to come and to come now yeah. however I totally agree um, with my esteemed colleague that we have made life difficult for ourselves, Godfrey. I was horrified, horrified to find out that uh, painkillers such as paracetamol um, can have different classifications across the border from where I live, sure. which is South Africa. And therefore, somebody who wants to move that product across the border needs to deal with a whole lot more paperwork in making sure that the classification now talks to that other country where they want to take that product. Of course, um, my colleague Sudan has indicated that a truck coming from Zambia to the Devon port has to have different pieces of paper at each and every single border that they are crossing. Mm. How long does that take? How much does that cost the economy? And the easiest solution to that is to move immediately onto digital platforms mm. and make sure that we harmonize those digital platforms. So I think as we solve our own problems within our own trading communities in pursuit of this continental free trade area, yeah. we will start talking to the issues that uh, Mr. Kant is raising and hopefully will start becoming even more attractive for our partners in the Indian continent. But I would say, please don't wait. The opportunity is now. Um, <laughs> come, come and invest in the in the continent. Thank you for that invitation. Um, I wanted to know, though, before I leave you, Busi, to go to Sweden. I wanted to know whether you are seeing the political commitment that's required to affect some of the simplicity uh, that uh, Mr. Kant is talking about uh, when you uh, speak to your government colleagues, when you try to engage them and make them understand the need to make it easier for businesses uh, to be able to invest. So the proof is, of course, going to be in the delivery. I am hearing more and more a focus on outcomes. Yeah. Um, every minister, every president uh, that I hear talk about the African continental free trade area, they are focusing on the outcomes. There are low-hanging fruit that I think this commitment to deliver as soon as possible. Yeah. Um, so the commitment is there. And I think we as business must continue making the noise, making sure that we flag the areas that can be smoothed out as quickly as possible. Digital platform is one of the easiest areas. I think there are systems mm -hmm. available all over the world that we can put. And there are innovators, both in this continent and in the Indian continent, that could answer those problems in a matter of weeks, if not um, days. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so then I don't want to ask you new questions. I wonder, though, if you have got thoughts on some of the things that have been raised by the other participants before I uh, uh, bring up another new issue. 
Well, I have a very close friend of mine um, who argues that um, while companies like Amazon through Blue Origin are going to the moon, uh, we are dealing with the water and light. Um, <laughs> yes, development takes time, um, but capital is shy. Um, and I think, as was said by my distinguished uh, colleagues, um, we need to make things simpler. I would also add, uh, Godfrey, that we need to be more transparent. Um, and the less transparency there is, yeah. um, a lot of that paperwork is a vehicle for rent seeking. Uh, call it, call um, it, call it, Sweden. Call it, call it. You, you, you're <laughs> saying corruption, right? Corruption. Please, come on, shout exactly. it out. Let's get it out. You know, <laughs> yeah. So, look, let's get over these. You know, we have tremendous opportunity. Um, this is a very rich continent, well endowed. Um, digitization is not going to happen in a vacuum. Um, agricultural value adding activity is not going to happen in a vacuum. Um, what we really need to do is we need to set our sights on some short, medium, and long-term goals and carefully chip away at those goals, and we will, you know, uh, reap the dividends mm -hmm. as Mauritius and other countries have. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I didn't want to talk about uh, the time it takes away to cross a border because that I've experienced on my own as an individual without goods. <laughs> but I know that the trucks that do the roaring trade from South Africa through Zimbabwe, Zambia into the DRC, on average, you are talking about three weeks on the road to travel the 3,000 kilometers that are required from here uh, to reach uh, the DRC. And you can imagine what happens in three weeks. Of course, the other guy has already gotten his goods, sold them, taken the invoice back and replowed the profits and started something else. So, yeah, that one, I don't know what we're going to do, the politicians, to make sure that that actually works because there's a lot of work uh, that needs to be done on that front. So then I wanted to explore the other third issue that you raised in your initial remarks, the creation of an ecosystem that enables the growth of trade on the African continent. Please explain to me what are the main components of that ecosystem and where you see it, perhaps, I don't know, in any kind of manifestation on the continent or whether we're still talking here concepts. Um, I think uh, they're, they're, they're very good examples. I'll start with the most obvious, which is manpower. Um, if you look at our educational systems, uh, they're really 1960s ready. Um, so how are we going to participate in a 21st century uh, uh, business environment when we're really, we don't even have academic institutions that are ready to train? So I think we need to seriously look at our human capacity. We need to look at our resources. Secondly, we need to look at basic things like infrastructure. Look at energy, for example. Most countries in Africa have 300 days of light, sunlight. So there are a lot of uh, off-grid solutions uh, to dealing with the power deficit that we have instead of struggling with uh, publicly uh, driven and inefficient uh, power providers. You know, with the constant load shedding, you can't do business. Um, look at transportation. Look at the state of our roads. Look at our rail. Look at our waterways. Um, we've got huge opportunities there, but, you know, there's the will to do it. Mm. We need to fix those. Mm. Um, and then we also need to have effective uh, court systems so that the laws are there. There are plenty of laws on the books. Yeah. But we don't have effective adjudication of disputes. And that increases the cost of money mm. and increases the cost of doing business. So we really need uh, to ensure that we have transparent and effective adjudicative mechanism. Yeah. Um, I think we also need to uh, look away from the traditional vehicles of economic development. And if you look at the US, for example, which has really leveraged substantially on this whole idea of intellectual property, and you look like 
look at people like Jake Bezos and those who own the means that facilitate this electronic discussion yeah. and that have really resulted in the, the markets being at an all-time high. People like Jack Ma, who are involved in uh, 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 initiatives, which are basically uh, the ability to create um, uh, human capacity that can be protected and, 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 and leveraged and sold. Yeah. Um, and we, 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 that would give us uh, many multiples of uh, uh, a return when in comparison to, say, selling coffee to a neighboring country. So, you know, we really have to come up with a strategic plan yeah. uh, for, based on current realities, how to do business. Yeah, absolutely. And I know there's a lot of work that's going on in the African Union in terms of trying to uh, get these things ready and also uh, speaking to the specific issues that are required to make sure that the African continental free trade area uh, succeeds. Um, but I was laughing to myself when you said we are 1960s ready and here we are in 2020 and uh, we are trying to uh, compete against some of the best in the world. There's a lot of work uh, to be done. Let me come to you, Mr. Kant, and uh, I will allow you to comment on any of the aspects that the other speakers have spoken about but i wanted you in particular to also talk about one of the themes that we are talking about in this webinar which is the issue of collaboration between india and uh, africa is there an opportunity here for a think tank such as yours to work perhaps with a think tank at the AU level or perhaps at the national level or perhaps just at the regional level or indeed within the private sector to come up with ways in which we can facilitate uh, an increase in the trade between uh, the two, one subcontinent and the continent and the other, but come on, between the two continents. No, there's a huge potential, there's a huge possibility and to my mind, uh, both India and Africa have massive, massive potential. Uh, however, there is a multitude of legacy issues. There is a need for predictability, consistency, uh, and rule of law and low tax rate regimes in both the places. And I think there are two things which I believe are necessary for this growth. Firstly, infrastructure. That is a necessary condition for enhancing trade. Good infrastructure increases factor productivity and makes firms com competitive. And this allows them to compete globally and become global leaders in their respective sectors. Secondly, institutional efficiency. The institutions in both India and Africa bear the weight of colonization. This has led to various inefficiencies in the institutions governing trade and investment. Therefore, institutional restructuring and governance simplification have to be undertaken to improve trade. In this regard, I think India's experience in improving its ease of doing business ranking in the last five years would help in Africa increase institutional efficiency. I would say that I would like to reiterate that the relations between India and Africa have stood the test of time and will reach new heights in the future. We are absolutely convinced that Africa's future is with India and India's future uh, is with Africa. And uh, I think both need to work together. Uh, our Prime Minister has declared Africa as a top priority region in our foreign and economic policy. And it is rightly, uh, it is famously said in India that Mahatma Gandhi attained enlightenment in Africa and Nelson Mandela attained enlightenment through the teachings of Gandhi. And therefore, both the nations are intertwined with each other. And when both grow and expand with each other's trade and investment, the world will grow and prosper. Thank you. Thank you very much. But do you have any think tanks that you are working with on the African continent at all? No, we don't, but we'd be very happy to work very closely with all African think tanks in different countries, and we would greatly appreciate the members here today facilitating that. Uh, we will be very, very happy to work with African think tanks. There we go. Another phone call or phone calls that I uh, would like to see uh, <laughs> developing out of uh, this collaboration uh, today. Uh, that's uh, thinking about 
ways in which we can increase trade between India and uh, the African continent. In the meantime, I was quickly just doing a very quick check of where India ranks in terms of the ease of doing business in the world. And I saw out of the 190 countries, it is sitting at uh, 63. And then I quickly checked our top ranked nation on the African continent. And I saw, yes, it's Mauritius. And it is ranked uh, 13 out of uh, the 190 countries. So well done, Mauritius. I also wanted to check uh, Rwanda uh, and see where it stands in terms of the world ranking and whether it's better than uh, India. And uh, here, the number that I am seeing is what? Uh, I'm seeing an average. I'm not seeing the actual number in terms of where it sits. I'll find that number and I'll share it with you. But it's an important comparison because if you remember, Mr. Kant spoke about the, the, the idea of a beauty contest, if you like. Um, those are my words. But he spoke about the idea of states in India competing to be uh, the best business environment in the country in terms of the ease of doing business. And he spoke about yeah. in the context of African countries themselves also being able to do this. Let's uh, come back and uh, bring in uh, Busi in terms of uh, trying to see if there are ways in which we can accelerate uh, connecting businesses on the African continent and businesses on the Indian uh, subcontinent. Busi, I asked a question earlier around the political will to effect this, but I want to tie it specifically uh, between India and Africa. Is it there? Do we need to create a platform separate, Bussi, from uh, the BRICS Business Council for facilitating trade between African countries and India? In my experience, Godfrey, there are several India South Africa fora, business fora, that meet on a bilateral basis to discuss opportunities of mutual interest. I believe that platforms such as this one that we are having today mm -hmm. are critical for us to build those bridges. And yes, I believe that uh, Mr. Khan will be getting emails or phone calls in terms <laughs> of linking up and getting taking lessons yes. from the Indian um, uh, progress that they've made. Because it's not just where the country is in terms of global rankings at the moment, but it is where it has come from to where it is now. That's where the lessons are going to come from. So, yes, I am observing quite a lot of interaction between the two nations, and I expect to see even a more concerted effort going forward. Absolutely. Let's uh, wrap up now, and I'd like to get your closing uh, thoughts, uh, gentlemen and uh, lady. If I can come to you, Sweden, uh, just in terms of your key messages uh, out of this session things that perhaps people can act on. I'm hoping that we generate conversations, emails, virtual meetings, and everything else that comes with it in order to try to increase this trade we're talking about. Sridhi, your closing thoughts. Can you hear me, Sridhi? Um, I okay. think, uh, as colleagues have said, this is a, a great moment. Uh, the fact that we're talking, I think, is is is... Is, 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 is a great yeah can you hear me yes go ahead can you hear me yes, yes we can hi godfrey yes i can hear you go right ahead okay yeah i was saying the fact that we are having this dialogue is uh, the fact that we are speaking is a very good first step. Um, if you look at where we were 20 years ago, the conversation about trade graduates. Uh, and so that, that is a great thing. I think what we really need to do is beyond the bilateral discussions that take place at a public sector level is to involve business and civil society um, in these discussions so that they may share their views about operationalizing the opportunities that we see. Thanks very much, uh, Sweden, for those thoughts. Uh, Mr. Kant, if I can come to you. I think today's uh, discussion and deliberations have been extremely fruitful. 
uh, both India and Africa have built alliances in all international forums. We've raised our voices together to protect the rights of the developing and the underdeveloped countries. Our shared views on the global trade order and greenhouse gas emissions are a few points to be mentioned. I would like this mutual relation to continue and grow in, in a very big way to promote trade and investment in each other countries. And I think we both need to work very closely and collaborate with each other. And this will be beneficial to both Africa and India. This is the first uh, Indo-Africa virtual summit. We're certainly hoping that there will be uh, a follow-up and that that gap that we've been talking about 500 billion expected by 2020 in trade between Africa and India is sitting somewhere around 67, 70 billion dollars and is therefore way short. Busi, this is your job. Your final thoughts. <laughs> Got free out, go back to that 500 billion dollars trade volume that our respective nations committed to in 2014 and say, let's use that as a target. <coughs> Maybe we can reach it over the next. 10 years if we as business commit to that. And I want an acknowledgement to my leader, um, Honorable Minister Amina Mohammed. I want to reiterate <coughs> that we have never needed each other more. So I hope that we are going to be moving forward over the next few decades, hand in glove together. Thank you, Godfrey. Absolutely. And it starts with the emails and phone calls flying about those potential areas of collaboration and uh, cooperation we spoke about. Thank you very much for watching. I am hoping the first Indo-Africa virtual summit hosted by us here at uh, CNBC Africa as well as the IMC of uh, India. Day two comes up tomorrow and there is more in terms of content that we hope can generate at the gap that we are all acknowledging and needs to be acknowledged. And I'd like to give my final thanks uh, to the two ministers who joined us today uh, to get uh, this meeting off and running. And we're certainly hoping that you got insights. As I was saying about uh, the minister from India's address, absolute shop window into India in terms of opportunities. So we're not talking about a one-way trade here where Indian capital flows into Africa. We're talking about a two-way trade. There is stuff for African companies to do in India as much as there is stuff for them to do here on the African continent. So tomorrow, my colleague Fifi Peters will be hosting a session uh, on uh, Big Pharma. And we know how strong India is on the pharmaceutical front. And then after that session, we also uh, be uh, hosting another session where we're talking about that big, big, big bear around whenever you talk about Africa, the lack of infrastructure on the African continent. Figures fly. $100 billion is short in terms of funding that infrastructure gap. And then people say, but what about the half a trillion dollars that's sitting in European capitals earning 0.00% when it should be coming home and being invested in the things that we need? Those questions are going to be answered tomorrow. But for today, it remains for me to say thank you uh, for joining us and we look forward to joining you again tomorrow and continuing the discussions around trying to find solutions and answers to making sure that we bridge that gap of building the trade that we require between India and Africa. Thank you for watching.